Facebook Live. Um, I'm just going to give everybody a few minutes to kind of jump on since we just started. Had a little technical difficulty with the um, computer. Uh, it will do my Zoom for some reason, but it won't allow my Zoom to interact with my Facebook and it won't let my Facebook camera work. So I have a helper today um, that's helping me behind the camera to um, kind of help me get my story out there today. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Tim. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so I'm not seeing your comments. I'm not looking at a monitor right now. Um, I don't know if there's anybody on since I'm not mm -hmm. really looking at it. <laughs> Someone just gave you a thumbs up there. Okay, so can you guys hear me and see me and everything? Yeah, I don't know if they, okay. I've never done this, so I'm a little nervous. Um, anyways, I wanted to start with um, my story that has happened with my three kiddos and the family court system here in Colorado. Um, my story starts as most probably do. We, um, I was, Eric Skinner is watching. I was married to a man, um, Cody, and we were married for 15 years. So it wasn't just a short lived divorce or a short lived marriage. Um, I got married when I turned 19. So I was very young. I was from Utah. So that was kind of the norm back then. Um, I always knew I wanted to be a mom and have kids and uh, my goal at the time then was um, nursing, uh, nursing school. Um, I had, uh, I guess I, I, I don't need to go clear back there, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of nervous and just trying to figure this out, but um, anyways, I had Alex and Lexi, um, they are twins, and they are 16 now. Um, I had them when Cody was in the military. And then Logan came along. Um, me and Cody were, we had been married, but we were separated. I was actually living in a hotel. We had had a house fire. He was staying at his dad's house, or so he says. I, I am not sure about that. Um, and I, so... We were not together. I did get pregnant with Logan then, and then um, we got back together uh, the end of November in 2010, and I found out I was 17 weeks along with Logan in January of 2011, and then Logan was born in June 2011. Um, Alexa Mallory says hi. Um, sorry, <laughs> I keep getting interrupted and my brain doesn't function that way. Um, anyways, my divorce then started in 2011, um, things just were not going well with Logan, um, being born, uh, my ex was very racist and Logan is a mixed child, um, he, th this was very hard because the story with Logan, um, my ex did not want him, he, um, did everything he could to try to make me give up my child to make uh, to make me uh, pretty much just abandon Logan and and give him away and just uh, have Alex and Lexi and him and I and I was not willing to do that. Um, I knew with Logan that I needed to be his number one supporter. That I was the one that you know brought him into this world and I needed to take care of him. So. Um, He's a very special blessing to begin with. Um, they told me I had not been able to get pregnant in eight, eight years and um, had a hard time with the twins. And so with Logan, he was kind of a huge surprise. And um, <clears throat> it was a very hard pregnancy, um, to say the least. Um, they said Logan had heart problems and probably would not survive um, when he was born. And... The, I had um, visits with primary children's and my doctors and had monthly echoes and uh, ultrasounds on Logan. And each month things kind of kept changing and, and getting better. And um, when Logan was born, um, he had no heart problems. Um, he was a healthy little baby boy um, with no heart issues. And he was just my world. Um, 
it, it was very hard because Cody um, was the one that was there when he was delivered via C-section. I remember the doctor held him up really quick. I didn't get to see him and I asked, um, you know, Cody, and well, I didn't get to see him. And he goes, well, he's black. And he walked out of the um, OR room and he left the hospital and he left me there. Uh, he did come back up two days later to drop off my twins, um, who were eight years old then, for me to babysit while he um, went and played ice hockey that night. So um, I'm sure the nurses loved that situation, but um, Cody had also found a couple and had promised Logan to them to adopt um, behind my back. Um, so then he was demanding that I could not bring Logan home from the hospital. Um, get you, I mean, I had just delivered a baby. Imagine the stress and the anxiety being alone. My entire family was back in Utah, my family. <laughs> I, I, I can get into that later. But um, just imagine the stress of a new mom and just, you know, having that piled on. Um, so I demanded that I was going to bring Logan home. Um, it was pretty much hell in our house. Um, I was not allowed to let Logan sleep in the same bedroom that he was in. Uh, he never wanted Logan in the front room with us. Um, if he was home, I wasn't allowed to breastfeed. Um, just a lot of a lot of different issues, and that's when I decided I'm I'm done. I want this divorce, and it was my decision. Um, even though he filed, we had gone and filed together, and literally I had no clue what we were doing, but the clerk just said, well, one of you has to be petitioner, and one's respondent. We had no clue, and so he went on as petitioner, and I went on as respondent. Uh, this was in 2000, the end of 2011, and then our final hearing was January of 2012. Me and Cody had everything worked out. The twins were 50-50, as it should be when both parents are completely, you know, um, good parents. And I've never tried to take those kids away from their father. Um, I, I believe that he needs to be in their life. We had decided that Logan would be with me 100% of the time since um, Cody never wanted him. Cody uh, never paid a dime for him, never had anything to really do with this child. Um, and so Logan was going to be with me and everything else was split. Um, I think uh, because of the difference in, in wages and I was on disability um, from having three back fusions when we got divorced and um, just the disparity. He's a computer programmer. So literally I, I got um, 400 a month in child support for two kids and, and this was with 50-50 custody. And then we had worked out 300 a month maintenance um, and that was until the twins turned 18, I believe. Um, we were supposed to uh, split the 401ks, uh, split the 2012 taxes and the home. Uh, I have yet to see any of that. Um, he admits in his filings and with his attorneys, um, Steve Epstein and Stephanie Holder, that he cashed out those 401ks of like 50,000, I can't remember the exact numbers, um, and to pay them. Um, and so I, I think that's gone. I don't know whatever happened with the home. I still have not got all my personal belongings. Um, they never allowed me to get, so I don't have yearbooks. I don't have my photos from when I was a kid. I don't have um, tons of my photos of my kids. Um, all my medical records were in there. Pretty much just everything that I had had. And um, Cody and his uh, family members that live in that home with him um, like locked me out, refused to let me in. Um, at the time we had Judge Hood as our judge that we had settled with um, amicably everything signed off in January of 2012 to June of 2012 where uh, Cody files to be able to take Logan away from me and say that he's the father and that he's always been there for Logan even though in January he stood in front of Judge Hood 
and said that he did not want Logan, that that was my responsibility, and he hadn't had Logan um, at all. So all of a sudden he wants Logan. And the reasoning behind that is Alex and Lexi were having a really hard time um, adjusting because they were now away from Logan. And the relationship that I had with all three of my kids, we were very tight, very close. Um, people can testify to this that were at church and that knew us. Um, we were very um, close and had a very good relationship. Um, the jealousy of that relationship uh, I think got involved. Um, I uh, I found out that as soon as I had moved out of the home in October um, of 2011, that um, Alex and Lexi were being taken from. I moved out of the family home so that because he, he was going to keep it to raise the kids in 50% of the time, and I had moved about 10 minutes away um, in a rental and. Come to find out, my twins told me that um, he, now this is like into June, but that they had never been staying at the home. Um, that ever since I had moved out, they had been staying with someone else in another home. And um, I can't mention this person's name or anything, um, and we'll get into that. But anyways, um, Sorry, I'm just, I'm trying to keep going, but not make this way, way long. Um, my mind. <laughs> you can't get all your stuff. Hmm? You're not able to get all your stuff. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, guys. Anyways, um, so I was never able to get any of my stuff. Finding out the kids were never staying at their home. Um, all of a sudden in, um, was it like August when school started, August, September, uh, Cody had gone and, um, put them in a school out in Westminster and without my knowledge, without my consent, even though we had 50, 50, everything went and put them out in a school out there, lied to print, lied to the principal, said that he had a hundred percent decision-making the principal and school allowed him to admit the kids saying, you need to bring me the court papers later, Mr. Stockwell, or my ex, he never did. And um, that's out in Jeffco schools. Um, so that kind of started, this all kind of started, there was issues, did you stop it? Mm -mm. Oh, it's going, okay. Um, so this all kind of just, everything just kind of started. Um, the twins were telling me that he was selling drugs while they were in the car, like, um, they could name the women's names, some woman's name. I can't remember these names, nor do they need to be out. But that he was doing this and, you know, of course, that they weren't at home and that their school got changed. And um, there was just a lot of changes. And all of a sudden, he's coming after Logan. And Judge Hood was really good friends with uh, Cody's attorney, Steve Epstein. Um, the very first hearing that we went back, I had to hire an attorney also. Um, Lance uh, Isaac and the two attorneys were in front of Hood and you know were by them and they're yelling at each other and fighting with each other just I mean very meanly and Hood finally um, you know stops them yells at them and stops them and says you both need to take care of your clients and stop fighting with each other and uh, Mr. Epstein said but your honor I'm the good Jew and Judge Hood just kind of laughed and shook his head yes and agreed. And at that point, I knew I am, like, totally screwed in this court system. I I knew that there was connections going on. I knew no law. Um, I, I, was, I had been a stay-at-home mom. Um, I had been on disability. I just was kind of, I just felt like I had just been run over pretty much. Um... So with Logan, um, Logan's dad um, has never really been in the picture. Like he came to court four times to try to fight for Logan at the beginning. Um, he saw Logan on my time. Um, of course, he's in the same boat I am right now. He hasn't seen him for years because of um, the situation. Um, Judge Hood, even though we had DNA evidence to prove, that um, Logan was Rupert's child and not Cody's. 
Cody uh, turned in the forged, um, I, I've had it online, but the vital records form where at the bottom it says ex-husband or husband and Judge Hood made us go fill this out. And after I had signed the bottom and they had signed the bottom, his um, SO and um, him had signed on this. She was the witness and... Um, a week later, I guess they had taken it into vital records, found out that this does not give you any access to the child that you're trying to take. I don't know exactly what all went on behind the scenes. I have a lot of emails. I um, have drunk texts that talk about um, a $10,000 payoff. So I really have no idea what happened. But all of a sudden, Judge Hood, we had a paternity hearing set for October of 2012. And in September um, of 2012, he all of a sudden ruled that we were no longer having a paternity hearing. He was not using the DNA as evidence, and he ruled that Cody was legal father. And that he would have Logan 50-50% of the time. Um, also, at that same time, we had filed to, well, this was before June, we had filed to have the entire divorce thrown out on fraud uh, because of all the financials and, you know, come to find out um, Cody had, you know, money. He had, like, cleaned out the bank account. Uh, of course, the 401ks, I don't know what happened with the house, and, of course, I never got my stuff. Um, so, we tried to get that thrown out. Hood, of course, denied it, and then... Um, got it stricken from the record um, in our case. I, of course, still have all of these, and I have them on discs from the court, too, from um, for my pills that I've had. Now, my first attorney, when they took Logan um, and they made this ruling, she said to me outside the court, don't you dare appeal this. I won't appeal it for you because Hood will take all three of your kids 100% of the time if you appeal his ruling. And right after that, um, like, I, I was scared to death to appeal. I, I literally, um, the person that I am today is not who I was um, back then. I've grown so much um, and I'm so different than uh, what I was. And so I was very um, uneducated, I guess, about the law and the justice system and how this all worked. Um, so uh, I did not appeal that ruling on Logan and I thought that I could, you know, fight in other ways to get custody and um, ultimately Judge Hood got moved. He made that ruling in September and January of 2013 he got put on the Supreme Court and this is after only four years being a judge. Um, Hood was denied six judgeships in Denver um, before... Um, he bought off the seventh judgeship with Judge, uh, uh, Governor Ritter. Um, he donated um, the max to his campaign fund, which I think was $1,000. But then he also held campaign fundraising events for him and did other things, which who knows how much that really was. And then he got his um, seat in the Denver Family Court, and that's where he literally used a, a fake birth certificate, one that has voided out my signature, um, to hand Logan to my ex and completely take him from me. Um, well, at that time, I guess we had 50-50 still. Um, our uh, divorce was only a year old when Hood left. And when I filed for um, like a change in custody, um, the magistrate, Magistrate Hubler, who is really tight with Hood. Their families are all really tight. Um, they have been since the 90s. Um, their families are from New York. Um, so there's, there's a lot of connections there. Um, but she stole our case when I put that in. And she, um, in Colorado, I don't know how it is in other states, but in Colorado, a magistrate can't touch your case for two years. And then even after the two-year mark, um, you have to give them permission. And I have literally put in probably eight things for her to recuse herself. I have, um, from day one, said I did not want her on my case, that she, by law, should not be on my case. 
um, she didn't care. Um, they continued to just break the laws. They, um, I kept bringing up that um, I was native, um, that I, because I'm Wallachi and Choctaw. Um, my uh, great grandfather and great grandmother, one was Wallachi, one was Choctaw. Um, when I kept bringing that up, by law, they have to look into that and find out. And she refused. Literally, her and Hood, like, they refused for years. And it's even in the orders. Like, every um, hearing, I would bring it up that there's ICWA that you need to be taking care of. The birth certificate is forged. Um, you know, just multiple things. And she denied everything that I put in front of her. Um, she even denied her own appeal, her CRM7 appeal that's supposed to go to the district judge on her. It's a magistrate appeal. She denied it. Um, I have all the paperwork to show all of this. Um, judge Lemon, who ruled that my ICWA motion, because um, I had put it into Magistrate Hewler, the ICWA motion, she denied it without even looking into it. And then when I put it in as an appeal to... Um, Judge Lemon. Judge Lemon said that it was an untimely motion to modify, which is totally not. The appeals court came down on Hubler and um, Judge Lemon for that one. I won my appeal um, without attorneys and up against his attorneys. Um, his attorney on that appeal did drop out halfway through. Um, I think she knew um, and she had threatened me so many times by email and stuff that if I Dared tried to file for ICWA that she would hit me, get me hit with charges, that Hubler would make me pay um, my ex's attorney's fees again, which she had ordered that at the very beginning that I had to pay um, as a punishment, I guess, um, saying that I was, it was vindictive to keep filing for my children. Um, I never have paid that. I will not pay that. Um, I was not vindictive. She has broke the law so many times. Literally, Logan is kidnapped right now. The birth certificate is forged. That's the only thing they use. They denied us a paternity hearing, right? Um, in Co in uh, Cody's lawyer's um, motions, it says that um, that Rupert never wanted Logan and that he had never asked for paternity. And then right in Hood's orders, it shows the, the exact day that Rupert came forward and claimed paternity and you know, we got the DNA test. Why would he do DNA tests if he didn't want anything to do with it? Why would he show up to court four times? But literally, it was a black guy coming into court and the judges dismissing him. Hubler, to the point, um, she was just rude about it. Like, I don't care that he's here. Like, why do you keep bringing up things that just don't matter? Okay. Um, that's, that's how she was in court with me. She's a very vile woman. Um, Magistrate Hubler, yeah, she stole this case. She's been protecting Hood, um, denying everything. Um, it, this got really out of control in 2013. I was in the hospital for a bile duct surgery for a week and had to have a major, major open surgery. And um, my ex and family went and got a false RO while I was in there. And... Uh, I had never been served with the temporary RO, so this was a final RO hearing that I had missed, and they literally called the hospital after, like, thanks for not showing up to the RO hearing. So when I got out of um, the hospital, like, I had to go up to find out what was wrong and file a thing saying, I have no idea what's going on, but I need another hearing. Um, well, with... Um, Within just days, I think, I can, I don't have the exact dates. Um, the police in Westminster, Westminster police were called because that's where my ex lives, saying that I broke this restraining order and so that it was a violation. So this is where Westminster comes in. Get you, I live in Aurora, clear out by Watkins almost, okay? Westminster comes out of jurisdiction, Shows up at my house, like, I'm sitting at the counter, like, eating dinner, like, standing at the counter eating dinner. I have a G-tube in that's, like, that hangs, you know, the thing hangs clear down. You can see it. Um, I, I can hardly move from my surgery. I'm still pretty sore. Um, it was Kalichia, uh, Chris Kalichia, Officer Kalichia, and Officer Erickson from Westminster that came out. And two Arapaho officers that had already come to my house to, like, 
detain me, I guess, for them. Just let them walk into my house and just sat there and watch them as they literally, um, uh, Kalichi uh, yelled for me to turn around. And so I started turning towards him since he's the one that gave the command. And, um, and he, like, he got angry and flipped me around so that to the other officer, like, yanked me around. He yanked my G-tube out of place when he did that. He yanked my shoulder out. Um, but he, like, flung me around. Um, and then when they handcuffed me, Erickson, which was a, a trainee, I guess, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. So, Kalichia was training him. He had put the cuffs on too tight. And they, now, get you, they got upset because I said, why am I being arrested? And I want to see the RO and asking questions. And right in their depositions, they admit that, you know, I never resisted. I never fought them. I wasn't yelling. I wasn't cussing, calling them names. I was simply asking them why. So with the handcuffs, I had asked the first time to um, Erickson. And I didn't know he was a trainee at the time until after this. Um, I had asked him if he could loosen the handcuff just on this, uh, the right side. The left side. Um, and he looked up to Kalichia, and Kalichia is like, no. And so they go to take me out, and mind you, it's snowing. I have no shoes on. Um, I think I had like a t shirt and like type sweatpants type um, things on. So no coat, nothing, no shoes, no socks. Uh, Westminster was just going to walk me out to the car like that, but. One of the officers from Arapaho stopped them and was kind enough to actually help me to get shoes on and a coat to go out. Um, at that moment, right before I got walked out the door, I had asked again for the handcuffs to be done. Erickson looks at Kalichia. Kalichia is like, hell no, and gets more angry. At the cop car, they go to put me in. They bash my head into the back of the, the car, like literally gash my, the back of my neck open. And then when they go to, like, put me in the next time, they kind of turn me because I'm in cuffs and kind of, like, shove me in. Well, they took me to Westminster, and then I was at Westminster for, like, four or five hours in their cell. All videotaped, but this video all disappeared when it came to trial time. Even though Sergeant Saylor, who was over these guys and over the whole situation at Westminster PD, um, said that they watched and they saw it. Um, it all of a sudden disappeared, kind of like anything does with Westminster. They're pretty crooked. Um, anyways, I was left in there for four hours, dry heaving the entire time. I had asked them to, for medical attention, asked them to go to the hospital. Um, they denied everything for four hours. Um, the judge ruled, um, the late Judge Wiley, the federal Judge Wiley, ruled that they had no indifference for my life, that they literally just did nothing, didn't, you know, re refused me help, um, pretty much, and I could have just died, and that I went through a lot of suffering for no reason. So, they finally take me to jail. I get out the next day. The first thing I do is go to the doctor to get everything checked out. I ended up being in a cast for six weeks for my arm. I had to have two shoulder surgeries to fix my shoulder. Uh, my G-tube had to, like, they had yanked it out part of the way, but they had done some damage inside. Um, my doctors uh, have said that um, with my bile ducts that it's too dangerous of a surgery because of w the damage that's done um, to try to go in and repair it again. So I, I deal with a lot of pain that I have to, um, I don't know, my body's kind of used to it at this point, but it's something I shouldn't have to deal with because of police brutality. Um, the, so I was only in for one night and that was out in Jeffco. So then, uh, the papers that I had filed just a few days before, uh, the judge had approved that we were going to have a hearing. Uh, we went to this hearing and I was able to prove that there was no need for an RO in the first place, that I did not know about the RO that the RO was not served properly, um, and we won. I won that. I was able to prove that they brought the um, the server, the process server in, and um, we were able to prove that I was not served correctly, 
that, you know, they just um, pretty much tried to do this uh, to, to gain control and whatever. So he threw out the restraining order and the charges um, got tossed by the DEA's office within the next month because, of course, the RO's gone. How are you going to fight these charges? There really was no R that it, RO that existed. Well, that right there upset Westminster and uh, Coetia. And Coetia and Sailor were both named in my federal lawsuit. Well, Coetia and Sailor are very close with Galbraith. Well, guess who took on Logan's case with Galbraith? Um, or with Westminster. It was Detective Galbraith. Um, is that up where you can see mm -hmm. me? Okay, it just looked like this. Um, Galbraith was angry that I had, that I was in a lawsuit with his buddies. Um, Sergeant Saylor ended up retiring. Um, this was complete retaliation when they came after me with seven charges um, for um, reporting Logan's um, sexual assaults in my ex's home. Logan came to me um, in August of 2016 and said that he, that stuff was happening to him, blah, blah, blah. Um, there's a lot that I can't talk about. Um, I reported it. I first called Beth Peters, who was his therapist. And Beth is a whole nother ballgame. Um, she was... She bought into their story. I, I'm sure that they lied to her and showed her all kinds of things, told her all kinds of untruths. She never took the time to get to know me. She was in the same office as a therapist that was my kids, my older kids therapist for years behind my back that even though we had 50-50 decision making, my ex kept taking them to therapy. I had even called this therapist and told her that she was not allowed to see my children again. And she continued for the next year to see my children. She has since hightailed it out of state and I don't know where she is exactly now. But Beth Peters is still here and uh, I'm going to make sure that I go after her license too. Um, she failed Logan huge. But I reported it to her. She never reported it to social services. So a few days later when I found out that she had not reported it to social services, I called social services and reported it. Um, Logan was taken in for a forensic, um, and they had yanked him from me. Like, they had taken him. I was trying to protect him, was not going to return him. The, uh, Westminster and Arapaho, like, forced me to take my child, literally, like, yanking him from my arms, pretty much. Um, giving him to my ex and that household where he was hurt. And my ex went and filed, uh, for, a. Uh, emergency restriction, which Hewler gave him. Um, and they, so I wasn't at the first forensic. Um, they did it like the next morning and they, the detec detective Galbraith, um, said in his things that Logan reported nothing. Um, Ralston house is where Logan did the forensic. They reported and lied in their records that Logan reported nothing. Now, these are videotaped, mind you, okay? So, I have these videotapes. These were used at my trial. Um, Logan tells everything. Logan's very honest in it. They ask him, does anyone else know? He said, Miss Beth and my mom know. How do they know? Because I told both of them. There again, he, you know, he admits he came to me and told me, so how is it false reporting on my end? He went to his therapist and told her she ignored him. Um, he says that um, in his, uh, well, before I get too far, um, so he reports everything. So Logan should have been out of that home, done, done deal, right there. They should have protected him. They should have protected that entire family, the, you know, and all of Jeffco and Westminster. Um, to be honest, um, but they didn't, uh, Hubler kept the restriction on me and I was literally seeing my kids on from Saturday at 10 AM till Sunday at 10 AM. Like that, that's all I had. And, um, you know, Galbraith had said that he had closed the case, um, that, that he had found no evidence, blah, blah, blah. So four months later, we're in uh, 
what, February of 2017. And Logan tells me that he, well, he tells our next door neighbor that he's still being hurt. I get called over there. He tells me that the story that he had just told the next door neighbor. The next door neighbor calls the cops, um, reports it. Because, of course, like, I'm not going to fail my child. I would still do the same thing to this day, but I would protect myself um, by recording every encounter I had. Um, so anyways, that time they take him to do a forensic and I'm there, but not of course allowed in the room during this forensic. Um, Galbraith gets very ang angry when I tell him that, uh, cause I'm in a federal lawsuit with, with Westminster during this time. Um, I tell him that you know, I will do a lie detector test if another department, like another county, um, is over it and not Westminster. And if, um, and that it would only, that I would only answer questions on, um, this investigation, not any of the lawsuit info or any of that. And he wouldn't agree to that. He wouldn't agree to that. And he got angry. And I said, um, uh, or my, uh, ex-husband had said to him, my husband at the time had said, and what are you going to do when your buddy fails? Um, which is Cody. What are you going to do when he bombs? Um, cause we both knew I hadn't been coaching these kids. I hadn't been, you know, telling Logan, Oh, you need to lie because that, that's just not me for the people that know me. I, I'm not going to do that to my child. I'm not going to do that to another child. I'm not going to do that to another human. Um, no one deserves to go through what Logan and I have gone through. No one, even my worst enemies. I wouldn't wish this upon them. Um, so after, uh, those reports, of course, Yo Logan got yanked away from me again. Um, and then, uh, Detective Galbraith says that he still has no evidence. There's nothing. Logan's not reporting. Um, and that he's closing the case, whatever. Well, so this is, uh, this is like April, March, April. Um, and in going back three months to January, I had been on a phone call with Galbraith Sergeant, Sergeant Stone at the time. And um, he was, um, I had already uh, won charges against CPS out in Jeffco um, for neglect. Uh, they got thrown out by the judge when I demanded trial. The judge knew that this was BS. Um, CPS has never been able to find anything in my home. So Sergeant Stone's like, well, because just because CPS didn't find anything, we'll, we'll go to the courts and we'll make sure that they hit you with charges. We'll make sure that they hit you with neglect charges at court and um, not, you know, not CPS, that the courts do it and that they take your kids. And that was his threat. And as soon as I got off that phone call and I was with my neighbor who heard the whole thing too. And I always, I had this old recorder that I recorded all my phone calls um, clear back then. So I have years, 10 years of phone calls recorded. Um, and I had sent an email to Galbraith immediately after, and that's the one that I posted online. Um, well, Galbraith, uh, wasn't answering any of my emails for months and months, and I had no idea what was going on. And then all of a sudden, um, we have this emergency hearing in Denver and Cody brings the charges from Westminster. This is in October, this is October 26th of 2017. And that's the last day that I saw my kids or held my kids, or touched my kids. Um, he brought these charges. I had never heard from a DA. I had never heard from the cops about anything. Galbraith had not answered any of my emails for months. All of a sudden he has these charges. So, okay. I know there's connections going on there. Um, and Hubler yanked my kids away from me 100%. Um, she put me on restrictions saying that using these charges, which is illegal, it is breaking the law. You can only use um, convictions, not accusations or charges. Only convictions. And she knows this law. Um, I've seen her use it in other cases when I've court watched. So I know she knows this law, but she didn't care in my case. And she yanked the kids completely. And I, well, I was supposed to get two court ordered, um, visits a week and two, uh, phone calls a week from all three kids. And, uh, my ex refused to 
follow any of the court orders, refused to let me have my visits, refused to let me ever talk to my children. I sent tons of emails, uh, called multiple times, um, filed tons of motions with the court um, during this time that that I was also being charged with seven false charges by Westminster and Jeff Code DA Josh Raz out there. Um, so I was dealing with two courts at once and um, Hubler was breaking the laws left and right, still refusing to do ICWA, still refusing to deal with the birth certificate, refusing to find him in contempt for anything. Even during this two years when I would put in motion saying he's refusing visits, he's refusing calls, she would just deny it all. Deny it all. Well, when the charges are cleared, when the charges are cleared, then we'll have a hearing. Well, the charges got cleared. It took her like six months to get a hearing after the charges got cleared. This woman has nothing but hate for me um, because I've dared push the boundaries and file motions and because I dare went and learned the law to fight for myself and my child, all three of my children, but mostly Logan at this point. Um, she despises me. This woman, um, you know that she's ruling with hate. Um, if you see the motions, if you see um, just, it did not matter who they put on the stand. Um, even one person that um, two psychiatrists had said was a habitual liar, and we had the medical records to prove that. Um, and they allowed an underage person to go on the stand without parental consent. Um, and this, and Hubler said, oh, I believe her over Miss Lee's. I believe her. No matter who they put on, they never had hard evidence for anything. My ex has told the courts that I have bipolar disorder, that I have borderline personality disorder. They're telling the whole world. They put it on the internet. They tell the cops. So in all these police reports, all the CPS reports, it's in there. And it's not my ex telling them. So it's, you know, these other people um, in this household that are telling him or telling the cops and that are really pushing this whole agenda. Um, anyway, so... My kids were yanked away from me. I fought these charges. It took 18 months for Jeff Code to get me through trial. Um, I It was a week-long trial. I uh, was hit with two counts of false reporting for reporting Logan's, one for each instance, even though I wasn't the one that reported it the second time. Um, and I was hit with attempt to influence a public official for both times, two counts, um, i.e. Westminster Detective David Galbraith um, said by sending him an email saying that I would go to the feds if he wasn't doing his job, that I was um, trying to influence him. Yet, um, the other party, as I've shown you, I've put up tons of emails that they have sent him. I have all the communications between them from Discovery. They opened up a whole door when I got Discovery. Um, we got everything from Denver. We got everything from Jeffco, from Westminster. They opened up a whole door of um, information that I had no clue about. So it kind of did them wrong. But anyways, I was found, um, the jury found me not guilty of, I was also hit with, uh, three counts of, uh, child abuse, um, for making Logan go through a forensic. And this is how crazy it was. I was hit with charges in, so October, 2017 with four charges initially, the two false reportings and two attempt to influence a public official. I, from the day one, I, when they came to me with a deal, I said, nope, no deals. I'm going to trial. Don't talk to me again until we go to trial. I had a public defender through this whole thing. They had two DAs on it the first trial, um, through the entire first thing. Um, sorry. Uh, anyways. So we get to, my trial didn't start until September of 2018, but a month before trial started, um, they were angry because I would not plea, I would not plea. They hit me with three counts of child abuse. Two counts saying that when my kids ran away back in 2013 from their dad's house, this is how desperate they were, that that was child abuse on my part, even though nothing was ever, like there was nothing ever found. And then one count for Logan for, of child abuse for making him do a forensic. Now these were added almost a year later, like 10 months later. Um, they were angry. They were desperate. Please tell me you don't see retaliation, right? Um, so the two counts of 
child abuse on Alex and Lexi were going to have to be in a separate trial. We got them separated. And so it was just five charges that I went to trial on. Um, the jury found me not guilty on uh, the first report, the uh, attempt to influence a public official, and the child abuse on Logan. They found me not guilty of those. They hung on the second count of attempt to influence and the second um, one for false reporting because Logan, in his second forensic, he literally hid behind a chair the whole time and said, I will not talk to you because the adults will hear. And last time, Cody beat me. That is all Logan would say. He was scared to death. These people still sent him home with these people. They still left him, and to this day, he's left here. All of these people have done this to this child. And it broke my heart when I saw these in trial and before trial, um, these videos of him and just how how badly he was felt by these people. Um, Jeffco Social Services was never even there for the first um, forensic, and they lied. They never watched it till a year and a half later, the night before trial, before they had to testify. They never watched it. They just took the um, Detective Galbraith's um, word for it and never watched, even when the second forensic came around, never took the time to watch. They didn't care. They weren't trying to protect Logan. They were doing what Galbraith wanted. Um, so, anyways, um, they were going to retry the two charges and then retry, or not retry, but... Um, uh, I would go to a lower court because the two were misdemeanor counts on, for child abuse for the 2013 issue that got added. Um, the day of my second trial, the day I show up, uh, charges all got dropped and they said that they would not be able to take the other two charges to trial either. And, well, no, that they wanted to take, that they were going to take them to trial and then the judge... Um, Pretty much at that point, Judge Ty, that's the first time that she put the hammer down and said, because she allowed them to get away with everything. Like, even, like, she didn't even um, make Logan, um, what do you call it? <laughs> uh, swear in before he testified, even though my attorney, like, fought this huge battle. Um, and she didn't make him uh, swear in until after his testimony. Those kind of things she did through the whole trial. She hated my attorney. She thought I was guilty and hated me. Um, so she finally, though, after 18 months and me starting to get loud, because this whole time I was silent because I kept being told, you need to be silent about this. You need to be silent. And they kept hitting me with more and more charges every time I would try to be loud and try to tell my story. Um, so she finally said enough and everything that was it, the charges. She, um, I can get them all wiped from my record, all seven, um, and so it's supposed to be over, right? No. Jeffco has now hit, or another uh, false RO got filed. And this, the judge um, said, because it was testified to that, oh, I was friends with MS-13. And at the time, I had no clue. This has been on for a year, this RO. I had no clue what MS-13 really was. Like, okay, um, whatever. Just the lies were just absurd. And that I was stalking them. Um following them and when I offered to give the judge my phone and say you want to check my GPS and see if I've ever even been around their home because you would find that I don't go out there. Um, the only time I'm in Jeffco is to go to court. Um, but anyways, this judge said, I, I understand that I'm violating your First Amendment right by this because they got mad that when I started posting the polygraphs and so an RO got filed and um, she said she didn't care that it was um, and this was Lori Fish out in Jeffco again so she didn't care that it was my first amendment right violation a first amendment right violation it was her court and she would do what she wanted in her court um she kind of slipped and talked about her relations or her um, friendship with uh, Detective Galbraith so there's just a lot going on um and then she uh retired all of a sudden too so the second judge to retire that had heard part of our case so anyways um uh there's the ro i got hit with the ro violation because i posted a polygraph the same polygraph i've posted thousands of times but it got posted in a westminster's mom's group that i had been a member of a whole year before for my work and stuff which i can prove so when this goes to court it 
it's going to be a joke. But um, I, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's just kind of how Westminster and Denver, everything kind of got really bad. Of course, there's tons more to my story. I know I've taken a lot of time and that's not what I wanted to do. Um, this is my first time and, and so I'm really sorry. I will get better at being able to tell my story and tell more. Um, I, um, I know you guys probably have a ton of questions and stuff and I probably will do a second part maybe tomorrow. Um, just a quick, you know, 10, 15 minute one to kind of, um, to, yeah, you can send me any questions. Um, I'll do one tomorrow that will kind of answer questions and kind of, um, explain kind of the rest of it. Uh, there's just so much that has happened in my case. It is just, um, so unreal. I, I feel sorry for anyone that has been involved with the family courts or the justice system. Um. Literally, my divorce was settled 50-50. Um, I had Logan, of course. Everything else was 50-50 and uh, until jealousy came in um, and another person came in, everything was fine. Um, and I think that the evidence is really going to be able to show um, once because um, I'm going to fight until the Justice Department comes in. Um, I really don't care about the feds, um, but the Justice Department, the FBI, I, I don't really trust, but the Justice Department needs to come in and, and stop what's going on with Denver and with, um, you know, and with Jeffco. Um, and, you know, a lot of the, the people here, you know, the governor, the attorney general, they're backing Justice Hood because he is their liberal vote here. And, um, you know, for a justice to be put on after only serving four years um, on the bench and after being denied six judgeships, you wonder. But then you see the connections and his law firm uh, that he was partners in. Those partners now are attorneys that come and do a lot of cases in front of the Supreme Court. And um, I think that's one of the issues, I think. Just, um, I, I think he's their bought off vote. I don't think, I know, I, um, I don't talk before I have the hard evidence to back what I say. So I can prove and show you, I have over 5,000 pieces of evidence, um, from discovery and everything else. Um, and I can back what I say. Uh, everything that I've been put, that I have put up on the internet, um, you know, I, I hope more of it kind of comes together for you, um. But, yeah, it's just a big mess. So, anyways, I wish all you mommies a happy Mother's Day. And I want you to all know that I, I know I know how hard this is. I know um, I haven't seen um, Alex and Lexi for three and a half years. And Logan, it's been almost three. Um, it's hard. Uh... But I wake up every day and fight for those three kids. Um, Alex and Lexi are old enough to make their own decisions. And my ex and, and the other people in that home are trying to get uh, my rights terminated, saying I abandoned those two and, and so that they can be adopted. Um, as you can see, the cycle of abuse just keeps on going. Um, the twin, you know, they turned 17 in August. So it's going to be a year why why do this uh, i i believe that there mm -hmm. it's something my ex is doing um to uh, try to hurt me even more that's what this is all about he doesn't care about logan he gets a 500 dollars a month from my disability which is going to be going away um, because i now work and have got off but he gets a 500 dollars a month um, payment for logan um with a false birth certificate that he took then to get federal benefits. So do you see how many laws this man has violated? Um, when the hammer gets dropped, I hope it gets dropped hard. Uh, that's all I can say. My kids deserve better. Your kids deserve better. Our system, Colorado, the United States, it deserves better. We need to fight. We need to come together. Um, tell your stories. Be loud. Um, they tried to silence me and keep me silent and guess what they did it for eight years and my kids were yanked for those eight years um hardly any relationship with them um and you know 
there's a lot of regrets. I'm not a perfect person, um, but I'm not the person that they've made me out to be either. And um, hopefully, you know, you guys will keep following my journey. And um, I'm always here for any of you that need help or advice. Um, I spend most of my time just learning, um, fighting, helping others. Uh, and then, of course, my job. Um, I'm a nanny for four beautiful little girls that are under four uh, for two separate families. Uh, I just hit my one year mark this week and um, it's absolutely amazing. These four little souls have, uh, they've saved me. God knew what I needed. Um, my heart definitely needed this job. Um, not just for the money, but um, yeah, it just, it saved, it saved me. It showed me how good of a person that I really am, that I still, that I'm a great mom. Um, I'm a great nanny and I'm a great person. Um, those little girls adore me. They always want their hair like Miss Jenny. They always, um, they were introverts, all four of them. They are not very much extroverts. Um, they sing and dance and they're very loud and very fun. So please never give up. Always have hope and always work on yourself and always fight for those kiddos because no one else can fight for them like their parents. All right, I'm signing off. Love to you all.